So I want to be respectful of everyone's time today. So we're going to get started with our rain harvesting workshop. Uh, quick introduction, I am Nicole Miller. I am the WaterWise Youth Program Coordinator, and I help out on the community side with Marianne as much as needed. And that's usually, um, during my summer times, I'm a little slower with my youth. And with COVID, it's definitely an, a new adventure. So I am the moderator today. I'll be doing some background things. If you have questions, um, you can email me or you can drop them in the chat box. We have, um, all participants are muted. Uh, your videos are off. This is just a security pro or safety protocol that the university likes us to do when we do our um, workshops. When you have questions, there is a um, chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen that you can use that will be um, keeping up with and trying to get those questions. We've got plenty of time within our workshop today for you to ask questions. And then toward the end of our presentation today, there will be a pop-up poll that I would really appreciate it if you took the time. It's only seven questions long and, and that gives us some data and, and how we did today. All right. So this is our quick agenda. After I am done, um, Marianne may do some further instructions. We have a sh couple short videos. We'll have some information after the uh, Q&A after those. Then Marianne has a presentation. We'll take a short break. Um, we have a short video and a little break time that's about eight minutes long. So if you need to get up, move around, take a stretch break, step away from the computer for anything and don't wanna miss anything, that would be your time to do that. And then Rick will come on and he has uh, several videos to present and then um, he'll have Q&A after each of those. And then also a presentation about the technical and um, aspects and some benefits of rain harvesting. Then we'll get to our poll. I'll make sure that the links for the uh, resources will be put into the chat box so you can click on them directly. And then we'll have some final remarks from Mary Ann. In Key West, Florida, you don't have groundwater in Key West, Florida. So every house there, before they build a house, the first thing they do is build a cistern, a big a concrete tank that they build the house on top of. And that water then is used for all their water needs, for drinking, landscaping, showering, for everything. Um, you may live in an area that has uh, rivers where uh, trains go by and every once in a while you'll hear about train derailments where toxic chemicals are being spilled into our, our river and our waterways and that water is used for drinking water for people downstream and they may be thinking maybe I could get a better quality water off my roof than I do from my local municipality and then we also have of course fracking going on that that's a, a remote chance of something happening because that's so deep where they're fracking but there always could be a spill or a break or a pipe that could then uh, pollute uh, our groundwater supply even though i've heard that it's a pretty remote chance of happening so when you think about rainwater it is a another thing is it doesn't use any electricity if you just use gravity from water coming out of the tank you're using zero electricity the highest usage of electricity here in the state of Arizona, and I believe in California also, is moving water from point A to point B. So when you open up your faucet on your kitchen sink and you have pressurized water, there's a lot of electricity used to get that water to your sink, or when you're out watering your garden with a hose. With rainwater, you don't use a pump, it just use gravity from the tank, you're using zero electricity. So it also is helping on our energy situation. So I want you to consider thinking about using rainwater uh, in your uh, wherever you are and uh, make it a part of your life and do something that's free. Once you get the system all set up, the rain just fills it year after year. Just keep using that rainwater and I think you'll uh, help the environment. Thank you very much. If you've been looking for a great way to conserve groundwater and landscape with better quality water, why not consider harvesting rainwater? Owner of o Oasis Water Harvesting, Rick Weisberg, is here with the details. Rick, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much for joining us. The first question I have for you is, how much water could somebody get, say, off of a 2,000 square foot home? Well, the formula is one inch of rain on 1,000 square feet is 600 gallons. So one inch of rain on a 2,000 square foot home, you're going to get uh, 1,200 gallons. 
that's a whole lot of water. And, you know, you're, like we say, we're not using up the groundwater. We're getting that, uh, that fresh rainwater. If someone is considering this, what size tank should they consider for their roof area? Well, I like seeing tanks that take two to three inches to fill up. If you get a tank that fills up an, an inch of rain, it's just you don't have much capacity. And here in the desert, when it doesn't rain for long periods of time, you want some capacity to get you into those drier times. So um, two to three inches off of a given roof area, for instance, a thousand square feet, one inch of rain would be 600 gallons, two, two inches of rain would be 1200 gallons, three inches of rain would be 1800 gallons. So to me, a, a 1500 gallon tank would be an ideal size tank for a thousand square feet of roof area. Well, I think a misconception might be that all water tanks are sort of created the same, right? Is that the case? Well, some tanks, um, they're all made out of the same material, polyethylene. But some tanks will let light in, especially the lighter colors. But the tanks I sell, these enteroplast tanks, they don't let any light in, so you don't have any algae issues with these tanks. Excellent. And so this whole idea of harvesting rainwater might really be a brand new concept to a lot of people. What do you find that most of your customers are actually using their rainwater for? Most people are using it for uh, landscaping purposes. Um, every once in a while, I've done some commercial jobs where we've done for uh, toilets, works great for that with the adding of a pump. Yeah, like we said, the plants and, and uh, you know, the, the landscaping, they love that fresh rainwater. Let's talk about um, why it's actually good for the desert. I did mention that a little bit, uh, but go a little more in depth in what you tell your customers uh, when they have questions about why it really is important to do this. Well, we live in the desert. We don't have any really big water sources, no rivers or lakes that a lot of people in the country do to have pull from. So we're relying on our groundwater and groundwater tables have been dropping over the years, especially here in Sierra Vista where I live. We are trying to keep the San Pedro River from drying up. So there's a big movement in our area to do a lot of water conservation, for instance, up on Fort Huachuca and here in Sierra Vista proper. So a lot of people are doing rainwater harvesting. Of course, rainwater, it's a better water for your plants anyway because it doesn't have the salts and calcium the groundwater does so it's kind of a win-win for your landscaping and so these systems are, are new to a lot of people and a great incentive for them to actually get one and start using it are rebates that they can get right tell us about the program yeah so tucson water has had a rebate program for quite a few years if, if you buy a tank that's over 800 gallons they will give you one dollar a gallon rebate so a 1000 gallon tank they'll give you $1,000 towards the purchase of that tank. And in those size tanks, the way I price my tanks, it pretty well covers the cost of the tank. You just have to take a three hour class, uh, which qualifies you for that rebate, fill out a form, and then send the receipt in with your uh, form and you get the rebate. Excellent, it sounds like a no brainer. And so if someone wants an estimate, how easy is it to get that? Yeah, so I do free on-site consultations with homeowners. It's part of the way I do my business. Um, and I like seeing the person's roof. I give them suggestions. We look at the sides of the roof. I tell them how much water they can collect off of that surface area that they're gonna collect the water off of. I give them a recommendation on what size tank I feel would be appropriate for that size roof area. Um, and, and so I do that as a service with my business. So I would uh, just call me up and uh, I'll book an appointment where I can come to your person, person's home. Well, it really is an exciting prospect, uh, you know, like you're saying, to preserve and conserve that groundwater, use rainwater that the landscaping just loves. And, of course, that rebate makes a lot of sense. So, Rick Weisberg, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you very much. And if you're interested, Oasis Water Harvesting does on-site consultations, like Rick just said. Um, good morning, and welcome to our rain harvesting workshop. Great that uh, you guys could all come this morning on this beautiful weekend. We super appreciate you having here. And also appreciate having Rick Weisberg here uh, from Oasis uh, Water Harvesting. Um, great guy, he's been doing this for 15 years. He's also an educator in water harvesting. Um, he's done many installations. I guess he's real busy right now and people are getting the chance to put in some rain harvesting, which is great, right before the monsoon. Go for it, woo! Um, so we're very excited to share some of the knowledge about rainwater harvesting today. I um, am the WaterWise coordinator, the community side, um, and rainwater is one of my favorite topics. I've also been 
uh, trained at the Watershed Management Group. I have a certificate in rainwater harvesting. So uh, we had a, did have a few questions for Rick. Um, someone asked, Christy, I think it was, Chris said, how long, why would you need 1,500 gallons? Uh, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be used while you collect it? It won't rain three inches in one day. And that was one question, if Rick wants to take that. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, the, the, the idea, that the other side of the equation is the demand side of your usage. I mean, some people, I go to some, I was at a home yesterday in, in Tucson and they had one living tree in their entire yard. And I, first thing I asked them, I says, why are you gonna harvest rainwater? Well, I found out they had just moved there and they have future projects to put in a garden and stuff. I said, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. Um, but it, it depends on you know, what kind of usage. If you have like fruit trees or citrus trees, a vegetable garden, you're gonna go through that water pretty quickly. Um, some people will say, well, in the monsoon season, I don't need to water as much because the rain is, is rain so much here. And I'll, I'll agree with them. Yes, but sometimes in my house, it doesn't rain for two or three weeks. So I cannot water my plants for two or three weeks. So I use that rainwater in those periods between rain events in the summer to uh, keep my gardens looking good. Um, so the, um, yeah, so, but if you, get a, if you get a small tank, and some people find this out um, the hard way, they'll buy a 50 gallon, 100 gallon tank, and they'll realize that water lasts for a day or two once they start using it, and then they have to wait for it to rain again. So most people, including uh, companies like Tucson Water, that rebate program, they realize the importance of larger tanks. So you have, your tank has to be a minimum of 800 gallons to get that big rebate. So it's just kind of a, um, a common sense thing here in the desert when it doesn't rain for periods of time to uh, have some capacity. Great, thanks Rick. Um, we also had another question from Chris um, asking, are there regulations for how long water can be retained before it is used? Um, like gray water needs to be used within 24 hours. Yeah, gray, gray water. I have seen some gray water systems. Um, a couple I can think of off the top of my head where they were underground uh, tanks and the water was definitely a grayish color and it didn't have any aroma to it. So it looked like it was okay. And then people were using this to uh, pump out into their landscaping. But I have heard uh, technically that gray water, especially if it has a lot of contaminants in it, it can start to um, go sour on you and get an aroma that is not pleasing. Um, and, and with gray water, you also want to make sure you're filtering out any particulates that might get in there, which might clog your drippers, your drip emitters. And the same Thanks. thing with rainwater. Yeah, they're very different water. I mean, we had a we had kind of a joke, standing joke with um, the prior uh, coordinator for this program, Cato, had 10-year-old water in her tank and it was completely clear and, and beautiful. And Rick was like, but you should be using it. Um, but um, that was an example of how, how clean rainwater can be. Um, someone here is writing, Pitho, I live in Pierce. I just had a 28,000 gallon tank put in, cool. Um, can I still get the rebate? I don't know of a rebate, do you, Rick? No, there's no rebates there. The only rebates now are in Tucson if you're a, if you're a Tucson water customer. We used to have- Yeah, rebates. unfortunately, I don't, we don't have any rebates down here in Cochise no, at the no, moment. Um, someone else is asking, um, three hour classes at Tucson Water, that's with the Watershed Management Group. I know they have some trainings online at the Watershed Management Group, so yeah, I would check that out. You may be able to do it that way during COVID. Um, great. So um, I think that's all of our questions at the moment. Um, thank you for those. And we'll go forward with our program. So um, yes, uh, we are part of the Cooperative Extension. I just quickly wanted to say that the WaterWise program educates in water conservation primarily and other uh, natural resource stewardship. <laughs> And we have the community side and the youth side. So please get on our mailing list if you aren't already and join us. And virtually at this point, which we're just kind of dealing uh, with uh, what that means and how to make our presentations um, 
online. So thank you for putting up with any technical difficulties. Um, so I'm doing a basic um, covering of uh, the components of rain harvesting and a little bit of the special features that I'm interested in. Um, this is our little quiz. So take a look at that. Um, which item is false? Uh, why harvest rain? To protect the aquifer, save groundwater, water plants because rainwater is hard, uh, or to have a water source to replace a failing well. Um, you can put it in the chat or you can just think it to yourself and we'll go to the answer, plants. C is the answer, plants. Like rainwater because it's soft, not hard. So it's kind of a trick question. Um, and lacks salts and calcium. And it usually takes a little bit, contains a little bit of nitrogen from or other animal secretions. <laughs> um, nothing um, too serious if you're filtering it. Next question, which is not a source of water supply for the people of Cochise County? So we have precipitation, runoff, storm water, which is what rain is called when it hits the ground, surface water, rivers and streams, groundwater pumped through wells, and effluent treated wastewater. So, Ready? The answer is C. We don't pull water for drinking or other uses off of our rivers and streams. So we're very dependent on groundwater and we have a small percentage of treated wastewater that's used various things like watering golf courses and so forth. Uh, this is a question for you. What will you use it for? There are a lot of different uses of um, rainwater. Commonly, it's landscape irrigation, and as we mentioned, plants love it, but there's also flushing toilets, which happens at Palominas um, Elementary School. Um, people wash their vehicles. The, the fire stations use it to wash their vehicles. It's very good for washing things. Um, livestock pets filter to drink, and people keep water around for fire suppression. So those are some of the main uses um, that I've thought of. I'm just gonna put in a little plug for native plants here before we go on because of course, when you're rain harvesting, you're very aware of how much water you're saving and how to use it well. And so I'm just putting a little plug for growing the natives because they use less water and they're better adapted to the environment and they um, have better adaptations against credit um, bugs and, and things that happen to them. Um, droughts and so forth. So this is a little difference between a local oak and a magnolia, which is not local, of the same size. All right, so when rain harvesting, we have two different collection methods. Um, we did have someone email earlier and saying, we're well, gonna talk about passive rain harvesting or rain gardens. And we, we'll, I'll bring it up briefly. Um, we do have two types. So there's passive, which is you store the water in the soil. So instead of letting it run off, you keep it around. Um, and active, where you store it in containers. So you're actively keeping it for yourself in a container. So here's passive. Uh, I don't think you can see my pointer on my computer. You see it coming down and going out of the gutters into the landscape. And in this case, being sort of retained in a French drain. So you, you need gutters, you need downspouts, but you don't need a tank. And here is um, a location that has some um, basins around trees so that the runoff coming across the land will go in there, stay longer. The water will be store, uh, stored in the soil. You can do uh, swales on contour on hillsides to get water and to grow things to uh, prevent erosion. It's any depression. It can be yeah, actually quite shallow. It could be like six to eight inches and you'll capture something. It's amazing. I mean, the trees are doing so well this season because the water that we had this winter is being stored in the soil. So it, it shows you just even getting that in there um, can help your plants throughout the season. And here's the U of A. They have extensive rain harvesting. They dig these rather deep basins, um, but they make sure that the water is infiltrated by 72 hours so there's no mosquitoes, but they dig it to be able to handle what they anticipate for a large peak rain and they're quite deep, some of them. And here's a little rock river. So it's a great, great practice um, to start making little impressions in your land, seeing where the water flows and then seeing where you can kind of keep it around and let it s slow spread and sink is the mantra for passive rain harvesting, slow spread and sink. 
Um, active is in tanks, so you need a container. Um, and you have water, as Rick mentioned, for the times when you need it. Um, and again, you're keeping the, the rain on, I call it keep the rain on your side or keep the rain on your property. Um, instead of running off, most of the water that runs off of our properties, especially in a more urban center with impermeable streets and so forth, evaporates before it gets anywhere near the aquifer. So we're trying to keep it around so it won't run away and evaporate. Uh oh. There we go. So here's the different parts. Um, we're going to go through these. So we have the collection, taking it to the storage, the storage, how it's distributed, and I'm going to cover a little bit about filtration today. Here is a picture. As you can see those various parts. Uh, the collection is almost always a roof. Um, conveyance is gutters and piping. Um, we have a first flush diverter here. You can see I can discuss that later. There's a tank. For some reason, it's partially underground in this one, and then overflow goes to a plant. And the distribution here is a hose tip, and there's a pump to pressurize it. So it's a, a nice system. Um, collection, here's a roof. Now um, you can see the gutters and downspouts. Um, is this passive or active? Oh, I, I, I went too fast. <laughs> passive rain harvesting, there is no tank. All right. So that's collection. Um, when you have a very complicated house, it's going to make collection a lot more difficult. Getting gutters in, having them sloped, and having a place for the gutters to meet a downspout and join up so it can go to your tank. So just you have to look at your roof and see, see which direction the water will be flowing off of the roof into where. Uh, that's why some people build rain roofs. I think they're really cool. I've only seen them in you know, fairly rural settings, but here is three examples. Um, the two, and the one in the right top corner was um, quite large. He used some materials that he already had because some people was like, why not put that up higher and have, you know, vehicle shade or something. But actually the, the materials he had were short. So he built it quite close to the ground. You can see where it drains out. There's a gutter at the end. Pretty cool. And then this one in the middle is a little higher. And then you can see a larger one, taller one down in the right left. Um, I'm sorry, right bottom corner going into a little white tank there. So they're usually made with metal and that's what they do. They collect rain and it's very easy to manage and take care of them. So um, thinking about your own situation, if, you, if you're new and you haven't um, thought about rain harvesting and how much you could harvest based on your collection area, you can um, do this formula. So first you measure your roof. You don't have to consider slope. Um, so you get the size of your measuring areas. If it's one roof, that's just one. If it's several roofs, you can add them together or decide which one you really harvest off of. And this is the formula. So Rick mentioned this earlier. Now in this, I've added, um, besides converting um, an inch of rain over a thousand square feet to gallons, I've added an efficiency factor um, it's kind of the stickiness, so what actually ends up in the tank after wind or things obstruct the gutters or whatever might happen to all of that rain might not make it into the tank. And that's more important if you're harvesting rain for all of your uses. You want to be more conservative about how you estimate it. So you do the inch first is the best way to do it. So your roof area and use it against an inch of rain and then when you wanna say, oh, it rained two inches, how much would that be? You just multiply the one inch times how many other inches of rain you have received. So how much water would two inches of rain yield? People, math people use that brain. Um, so that would be 1,060 gallons, so that's the formula. We have these formulas in our handouts on the WaterWise website in the rain harvesting section that Cato Daly made um, with Cynthia Wilkins, and um, you can find a lot of this information in those handouts. You can also determine how much might come across um, a lot by um, doing the same thing, um, seeing 
the rainfall on a given area, depending on the slope, of course, so it slopes towards where you might be calculating, take the area that has that slope um, and use the same formula, but it's a different efficiency factor because, of course, it's not as impermeable and some of that rain will sink in as it's flowing down. So that's an interesting um, thing to think about, especially if you're doing passive rain harvesting. Um, here are two just different examples, just to get some quantities in mind. Um, for a 1500 square foot house in Sierra Vista with the average annual rainfall of 14 inches. And then um, a little more rainfall happens in Bisbee. So you can kind of get an idea of like if you wanted all that rain from that 1500 square foot that would, you would get in a year, you can kind of think, ah, it's about 10,000 gallons or 15,000 gallons. But, you know, of course you will be emptying it as you go along. So you wouldn't necessarily need to harvest uh, to retain all that in a tank, but it just gives you an idea how much is there for the taking. Um, again, to kind of compare the demand against what you can harvest, uh, I just put a little um, calculations up here. This is pretty modest, two fruit trees in a, in a garden watered um, during the dry season. And so that's 2,000 gallons. So, you know, it'd be nice to have that um, or more. Uh, and then uh, here's just an idea of kind of how much things need to be watered. Um, this PowerPoint will be on the WaterWise website um, under our events tab. You can scroll down. So if you wanted to look at any of this stuff again, you'd have that opportunity. Uh, we're on to conveyance. And I like this picture of the Bisbee bathrooms in Grassy Park because they painted that gutter next to the brick. And I just think that's kind of like very tasteful and cool. And that's a, a cistern made from a culvert. Um, this also is some information you could peruse at your leisure. Um, I'm, we're really kind of promoting big gutters. Why not? You don't want to overflow. Um, if you can, you know, make that happen. Um, plastic gutters do tend to melt and bend, and um, you need a slope. Uh, you need sufficient downspouts, or it won't won't drain properly. And um, Again, bigger pipes. Uh, I think this is just, this is a funny picture. I just think because it's, you know, they're looking, there's no downspouts. All you see is the down is the downspout because the gutters are on the sides of the building. But that's one way to solve the problem of getting the water into this tank from two sides of the building. Pretty cool. Two types of conveyance systems. Um, this will be in your homework. Um, one is wet, one is dry. So the wet is because if the rain um, stops and the tank is full, you may have some water in that pipe um, that's going below ground into the tank. And dry, it just comes straight off the roof into the top of the tank. Um, storage containers. Now I'm going to move through this kind of quickly um, just to see the different types of options. I'm sure Rick will show you more pictures of tanks, um, but here we go. Lovely rain barrel. Painted rain barrel. Two of them together. These are metal barrels, recycled. Not a bad idea, especially if you keep it covered um, and keep the mosquito and algae down. Um, IBC totes, those are available in Douglas. They come in 250 or 270 gallon sizes. Quite economical. Here's three of them together, linked. Beautiful tank. Um, this is one of the women on our tour a couple years ago. I think Rick put this tank in. Nice and um, Small footprint for that tank. Beautiful Western view. Nice big tank in Bisbee. And there's filters is rainwater. So you can see three filters and a little I, I'm sorry, UV um, zapper there on his rainwater system to provide his drinking water. He decided he wanted to drink rainwater and not drink brown water anymore. 
in part to save groundwater and also in part because he thinks it's the better water. Also in Bisbee, um, nice big tanks. So that's a great setup there. See the pressure pump, beautiful setup. Also on a rain harvesting tour last year. Uh, interesting tank. Another big tank, you see there's two of them and it has a pipe, uh, pump in the background. Interesting tank. I don't know the size, it's quite amazing. Um, it has, it's a ferro cement, so it has a rebar and wire, which cement is put on top of. Very cool. Underground polyethylene. This is very common in Hawaii. You see a lot of people use um, swimming pool tanks um, for all their water uses. I don't know how big that is. If you want to guess, put it in the chat, please. Thanks. This is a local tank that's being built right now with earth bag construction, and it's going to have a poly, poly liner. And she's um, actually moistening there in the bottom right, the um, cement that goes into the wire. And it's surrounded by a gabion wall. Quite large. Right? Very labor intensive, but economical. They filled those bags, I'm sorry, they filled those bags themselves with sand, well, dirt mixture. Um, another tank has a, what they call a roof washer next to it. You don't see those a lot around here. They are filters in little tanks that happen before the water goes in the tank called a roof washer. Very familiar site for Rick. These are his tanks. And nice big amount of water there. The fuel tank and the polyethylene tank on the right. This is a underground cistern outside of Tucson, the Tucson mountains that was put in quite a few years ago, maybe 12 years ago. You can see on the left, there is a roof washer there that they use to pre-filter the water before it gets in the tank. That, that kind of is an optical illusion of actually that's quite a flat surface. It's like a dance floor. Um, and they have a, a large tank underneath there and they've been using that water for all their needs for I think 12 years. So it's, it's basically a swimming pool that's underground with a top on it. Cement, cement structure. Big tank up in St. David. This is Derek Howlett, who um, has the Handyman um, YouTube channel, explains everything about everything he does. Um, beautiful tank. Um, so that's just gorgeous. And um, check out his um, web channel. This is actually, his home will use, he's building a home now, so it will use um, rainwater for all of its uses. And he currently does that with um, a smaller home. Underground modular system, I just estimated this. These are quite, can be quite, quite large. Um, I haven't seen one in person, but it's an interesting option. Underground tank. There's one at the Watershed Management Group. They use um, rain for all their uses there at the offices. And that was the sizes. Now you have um, two other things I wanted just to mention about tanks is input and output, and they should be with roughly the same size. And Rick might get into a little bit of that, but you want a, a good overflow in case of a rain, and you want to know where that water is going to go. And you also want to make sure that there's some kind of guard on the end that critters can't crawl up into the tank and drown. Another beautiful tank. There's two of them here actually. Um, is this a wet or dry delivery? Put it in the chat or think about it. And here comes the answer. It's a wet delivery. So it goes underground from a house quite a distance away and comes up into, into the tank. I don't imagine that overflow is finished. Um, they would hopefully take that water somewhere, not just have it splashed down by the base of the tank. 
filtration. Um, this is Rick putting in a basket strainer on a quite a large tank um, with a fine mesh. That's a good way to filter out leaves and so forth. On the right is a first flush system. You can buy very fancy ones, but it's basically um, just a pipe that comes down and fills with a clean out at the bottom. And when it's full, the water goes past the vertical pipe into the tank called a first flush. So the dirtiest water is flushed from the roof um, in a sense that it fills up this pipe and then the sediment stays in there and the cleaner water goes into the tank. Uh, here's another one. This is also on one of our off the grid tours, lovely homestead um, outside of Bisbee and you can see the first flush and then the water goes into the tank. Um, quite simple and effective. Um, usually it's about 10 gallons. Again, is this a wet or dry delivery? It's a dry. Coming straight off the roof. You can't see the roof over at the left. Um, Pre-filtration, um, this isn't strictly filtration, but um, big gutters and pipes keep water and debris moving. So it's, um, it's, of course, it's a matter of cost, but if you can do the upfront cost, it's worth it. Um, you can also do rain screens, um, leaf eaters, rain heads, they're often called um, near the downspout. This and the middle picture is a rain gutter. We don't really recommend those because people tend not to want to get up there and clean those and things get through them anyway. Um, and as I said, they're often not cleaned out. However, you could put it in a more convenient location with a wet delivery like this. Mosquitoes are often an issue, um, as I mentioned, in past rain harvest, and you want to make sure your basin at a peak rain event will drain within 72 hours. And you can also put tanks, um, if you're using it for irrigation, put in mosquito dunks. All right, I'm going to move on to filtration. Um, just a little bit about rainwater quality, very high quality water. Um, Texas has a lot of rain harvesting. Um, they're kind of ahead of us in, in a sense um, because of some of their major droughts and um, the Texas Water Development Board has been promoting that and they have a, a wonderful uh, rain harvesting manual too. So you see it's soft and you, you know, you can use the pH um, and it's free from a lot of the disinfection byproducts that happen with our water treatment because they're trying to pull out so many things these days that are in our products and also some of the things that are in um, our groundwater like arsenic and lead can happen. So it's a good, it's a good rain. I mean, it's a good water, very good quality water. Also good for cleaning, things shiny, get very clean, especially your hair. Um, so I'm just going to quickly touch upon filtration for drinking. I, I feel like we do have more people who are harvesting rain for all of their uses in rural areas, in rural settings. So um, this is one that go, uh, went with that 26 gallon, 1,000 gallon underground tank in the Tucson Mountains. And um, this is kind of interesting. You can see it has a pre-filtration at the bottom. And then this is a UV, and they actually have filtration after the UV, which is interesting. Um, a 10 micron filtration, I'm not sure why. I, he said to take out some of the things that have been zapped, um, but that's, that's, that's cool. Um, they have the roof washer before the tank, so the water that comes in here is pretty clean. Here's a, this is the typical, um, what we're advocating at the Cooperative Extension, three pond filtration, you have um, a, a paper filter or a cloth filter um, for my five micron size particles. Um, Aquavated charcoal gets out bad odors and some of the things in water um, like VOCs, um, volatile organic compounds, and then you have the UV zapper to get out your pathogens um, and um, giardia and things like that. So it um, disinfects the water. And there's a pump there at the bottom, which has a pressure, the pressure pump. So you don't need a pressure tank. 
Here's a, another system, um, a little different, and I don't wanna to get too detailed in here, but I don't know if you can see my mouse, but they have some pre-filtration. This is for earth ships. And they filter off the roof through sort of a gravel. So they have more sediment coming in and then um, after the pump, so they're, they're filtering before the pump. And then they have some um, particle filters here. Uh, a couple of them of different sizes, so you're getting smaller and smaller particles out. And then this is a, can, a porcelain candle filtration. So they don't use the UV, they use that instead. Um, this is, a, again, a drawing of an earth ship schematic. Um, so the water comes off the roof and goes into the tank, and then it's filtered. And they also have um, a whole uh, system for filter their gray water and black water. Anyway, it's interesting to see the variations in how people are filtering water, but a lot of the principles are the same. Okay, and then we have, um, this is just to, to kind of let you know the considerations. If you were to use rain for um, a lot of your demand, you would consider these um, four factors and kind of balance them out. Um, and especially if you're going to rely entirely on rainwater. Um, here's a homestead that was on our off-the-grid tour. You kind of see what's happening here. They have a nice rainfall. Um, they have not a lot of storage, so they, have, they go through it rather quickly, but it fills up um, because they have more than they actually use. Um, they're very um, spare in their use. So um, they also have some filtration in their garage. Um, so that gives you an idea of what is, they have 36 gallons GPCD um, from this rainfall. And that is gallons per person per day, which is not bad. Uh, I think, you know, people can use a lot more. Um, in Sierra Vista, just the indoor use is about 70 per day. But once you start harvesting rain and are very frugal with your water, you can you can go from 25 to 50 gallons a day per person without too much pain. And Rick will cover more of the distribution um, and pumping. And I'll just go through some maintenance real quick. Um, again, this will be on the website if you wanted to look more closely at some of these things. You know, basic draining the first flush to get that sediment and dirty water out. Uh, before the next rain is very important. You want to inspect things. Um, you want to, you know, make sure your gutters are clean and things are working and you don't have any uh, leaks. Um, vegetation over the roof is an issue. That's why some people want to build a rain roof because their, their own home is covered with trees, which is not great for fire, so that's another issue. Um, you know, just a general inspection and Cleaning filters and replacing filters is very important when you have drinking water and you are also UV lamps need to be replaced. So that is the story. And here's a few of the benefits. I think Rick covered most of these. Um, yes, we can, if you, if you keep water in the soil, it does reduce on the contaminations that would end up in the aquifer soil is a good filter as well. And um, you can get some of that water down in the ground. Also, they did some studies on rain harvesting and people were actually in certain places forced to do it. Not many, but a few. And they actually ended up liking it because they like doing, they like learning something new and participating in something different. Quiz, put in the correct order. How would you know? I don't know, but just think about it. And it is actually the Virgin Islands, probably out of necessity and lack of groundwater. Um, Hawaii is also, I don't think, has a lot of accessible groundwater. And as I said, that a lot of people use swimming pools. Texas, and there's Arizona, fourth, for the U.S. state or territory activity. Pretty cool. Um, Santa Fe, I'd like to see something like, a, like this around here. If you have a large home that we would eventually um, demand legally have an ordinance for rain harvesting to save our groundwater with every home that exceeds a certain size. Be a nice thing, uh, in my view. And yeah, also to have, you know, a lot of um, gardens using rain that's been harvested or gray water and um, 
for people to start thinking about grain harvesting on a larger scale if they need to or want to or have anxiety about their wells. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. And um, I'll get out of here. Marianne, there was a question earlier. I don't know whether you or Rick wants to answer it, but it was asked by Chris again. Can it be collected or I, can rain be collected from something other than a roof, perhaps rain off, runoff or something of that sort? Into a, into a, I'm not sure if they mean into a container or into the soil. You, yes, you can collect it into the soil in a basin where it will stick around and then sink and be used by the plants that are planted nearby. Um, you could, people put tarps down sometimes to harvest rain. I heard some people put a billboard down on a slope that, that's a pipe cut into the bottom of it and it goes out. So I guess yes, um, depending on if there was a container involved. So if that doesn't answer your question, let me know and we can visit that again. I have an interesting answer. A number of years ago, I built a 50,000 gallon tank for a gentleman outside of Phoenix. It had 250 trees on his property. And the water he was using, the groundwater he was using, was killing the trees because it was so salty and so alkaline. You could see white rings from the drip emitters around the bases of all the plants because so much salt. Right. So he, he had a shop, he had a house, but he was trying something very much out of the unusual. He was going to collect the water off the ground. So he built a, um, a depression at the bottom of his property, and when it would rain, it would we call sheet flow, where the water just runs across the soil, and it would collect in that depression, and then he would pump it up to another depression up by the tank and let the water settle out for a little bit. In other words, let the, the fine particulate settle to the bottom of the pond, and then he would pump that water into the 50,000 gallon tank, um, he only had about two acres of land, so I, I was telling him, well, you're just going to need um, more acreage. So he went and bought, um, I think it was 10 acres of land behind his property that, that um, flowed on his property. Then I told him, now you're going to have to deal about flooding issues, because if you get a good rain event, you're going to get so much water in your ponds, it's going to overflow, and he has neighbors around him. And that 10 acres accessed another 100 acres. So, yeah, so he filled that tank up. But I told him, you, you know, you're going to get a lot of um, sediment in the bottom of your tank. This is one of those metal tanks with a liner. And um, so we made uh, one part of the tank a lower depression area. So he could clean the tank out periodically. Uh -huh. But he was going to get a lot of mud in the yeah. bottom of that tank over time. Because it was just not as, you've got sticks and leaves and, cigarette butts and all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff that's on the ground that's typically not on a roof that you're going to have to filter to, which you yeah, do. not a lot less control. Anyway, that was kind of interesting yeah. story about Quality. Like, on, not on a roof. Right. Oh, interesting. Did you go back and see how, how bad it got? <laughs> no, he said he had it filled within a, oh, six months after he had it built. He, his tank was full and he was using it for all the trees. That's cool. All right. Well, we'll hand it over to Rick. Um, I think we were going to take a short break at this point. Oh, yes, we are. So I'm going to share my screen again. If you need to take a restroom break, there's a short video we are going to be showing if you want to watch that and then take your break. Uh, My name is Joe Caputo. I'm a park ranger here at Karchner Caverns State Park. I work in the maintenance department. I've been here for 18 years. Karchner Caverns, a living cave. It's been a state park since 1999. It's totally dependent on rainfall and the, and the water table of the area to put water into the cave. So things that we can do to minimize the amount of water and groundwater that we're using here will be impactful and allow more water to make it into the caverns. At Karcher Caverns, we get about 200 to 250,000 visitors a year. We use between two and a half and three million gallons of water on the park for the different functions. 
and our groundwater has been dropping over the years. And, and a way to combat that is for us to use rainwater in maintenance and operations of the park when we can. Hi, I'm Rick Weisberg with Oasis Water Harvesting. I have a personal relationship with uh, one of the park rangers here and we got talking about their uh, water conservation issues here and thought, well, let's make a bigger system for your septic tank. We put in two 2,600 gallon Duraplast tanks, which we added to a 1,000 gallon fiberglass leg tank that it, they've been using for a year or two. So we're here collecting off of uh, one half of their shop roof building. It's about 1,800 square feet of roof on this side of their shop. This system allows us to capture water off the roof and use it at the sewage treatment plant. And all the water that we can save out of the well is water that we can keep into the cave. That 1,800 square feet is gonna give them 1,100 gallons of water with one inch of rain, but it'll stay full through the whole monsoon season easily. And then after the monsoon season's over, we get our uh, infrequent winter rains where it'll keep adding water to the system as they're using water. Um, we hope it to last uh, well into the spring of next year before they start running out of water. So on a daily basis at Karchner Caverns, we have to take care of the sewage treatment plant and we use water for that. Normally we were using groundwater. Now with the installation of our rainwater harvesting system, we're hoping to use rainwater exclusively in our daily operations out here. Um, normally we spend a, an hour or so out here using 50 to 100 gallons of water to clean the sewage treatment plant, break up the sludge, wash down the sidewalls, and, and keep everything clean and, and moving along out here. We feel this system will be capable of producing uh, at least 12 to 15,000 gallons a year for us, and we should be able to do all of our maintenance at the plant without having to use our groundwater. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get started again today. Um, we are going to move into Rick Weisberg's portion of the workshop. I'm going to show a couple of videos and after each video or during the videos, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and we will answer them at the end of each video. Flat level, clean spots with the tank, break the rocks off the surface because um, over a period of time, with the water in this tank and the weight, a rock could work its way through the bottom of the tank. Um, also, if you're gonna put on concrete or dirt, don't put a tank on both at the same time. In other words, what I'm saying, if you're either gonna put it on concrete, it's gotta have concrete under the entire base of the tank, or it's gonna be on dirt, all dirt under the tank. But don't put it like half on the sidewalk and half on dirt, because that's gonna create a pressure point at the edge of that concrete that once again could jeopardize the tank uh, structural integrity. What this customer did, which is very nice, I want to point out, is he built redwood two by four frames around where all the tanks were going to sit and then filled that in with pea gravel. Pea gravel is a very nice uh, substrate to put under your tank because it's a very, it's a quarter minus type material. There are no big rocks in it. And it also holds its shape better than sand does. You put sand under a tank, that's fine, but then you need to put a larger aggregate of gravel around the base of the tank so over time, water coming down the outside of the tank from rainfall doesn't eventually wash that base away around your edge. And so what you'll end up doing is the, the, the edge of the tank will settle, but the bottom won't. So then you've got your bottom of the tank, tank starts getting a dome look effect. This customer wanted to put the tank on concrete. It is uh, about three to four inches deep. When you put a tank on concrete, you absolutely want to make sure there are no rocks on top of the concrete when you put the tank down. So have your broom ready, clean it good, really good before you put the tank down and then make a very firm solid. Base. If you're going to do the concrete yourself, we recommend that you use some rebar in there or, or and some driveway mesh, which is a wire that's on a four by four inch grid that just keeps the concrete from cracking over time. But uh, you might want to call a professional and have them do the concrete. All right, I, did anyone have questions on that particular section? Or are we ready to move forward? Rick, did you have any comments on this one? Um, no. No? Yeah. 
So here came a quick question. How long does installation usually take? <clears throat> well, installation, um, if the ba base is prepped when uh, I show up with the tank, it just takes a half hour to an hour to set the tank in place. I install the overflow, put in the ball valve, put in the basket strainer, and that's done. Now, if you need gutters, that's the other half of the equation. You need to get in touch with a guttering company. Uh, there's a couple of here in Sierra Vista, and I have a company I work with in Tucson <clears throat> that does my gutters for my customers. All right. Again, if you have questions, please just drop them in the chat and we will answer them after our next <clears throat> video. My name is Rick Weisberg. I'm with a company called Oasis Water Harvesting, which I started 13 years ago. What we have here is a 200 gallon Enduroplast tank with what we call a dry delivery system. This is where you're gonna have a downspout coming off of a gutter into the top of the tank where your basket strainer is. It's best if you can attach your downspout to a solid either post or wall so it's secure in high winds, doesn't move around. But as long as you get from the downspout into the top of the tank. So with a dry delivery system, it's a lot more cost effective than a wet delivery system. With a wet delivery system, you got the expense of buying the pipe, use three inch or four inch schedule 40 pipe. You got the cost of digging the ditch, the time to do it. It's just more time consuming, more costly, idea with a wet delivery system is that you have pipe coming from the roof area going into the tank. The top of the tank needs to be lower than the top of your roof area. Um, if you're coming off of a gutter or a scupper, that needs to be at least one to two feet difference between the height of the tank. At this end down here, you'll see the pipes that go into the top of the tanks. Next time it rains, this, this pipe here will start filling with water. The higher the water backs up, the more pressure it's going to create, pushing the water through the four inch pipe up and into the uh, first 2,600 gallon tank. It has advantages because you can put the tank anywhere you want to. It doesn't need to be right next to the building, right under a gutter, or right under a scupper to get the water directly into the roof with a dry delivery system. With this, you could put the tank 100 feet away from the building as long as you run a ditch from the building over to the tank, as long as the top of the tank is lower than your pipe coming off your roof, um, by at least one to two feet, once again, larger square footage areas, you want more height, smaller square footage or areas, you can get by with less height difference. The reason why we picked a wet delivery system is because there is no gutter or scupper to tie into to bring the water into these tanks. All right, we have a couple more questions with this section. Uh, the first one comes from Karen, says, do you have anyone who can figure out how to put gutters on a metal building, like a large carport type structure? The, that all depends on, I mean, on the way the building is built. Um, typically that can be done. I, I haven't seen an instance where it couldn't be, but uh, gutter, gutter guys are very creative with how they, attach gutters to buildings. So most likely I would say yes, it could be done, but it would have to be looked at and, and evaluated. Okay. All right, if there are no more questions at this time, we're gonna move oh. on. I'm sorry, Rick, did you have something to comment? I'm sorry. No, no. That's no? Fine. All right, we're gonna look at pumps, I believe, next. Hi, this is Rick again with Oasis Water Harvesting. Today we're gonna to talk about different kinds of pumps. I'm a strong believer in using pumps. Um, and the reason why, I think if the water is convenient, you'll use it more often. So a common question we get from homeowners and people putting in larger systems is what kind of pump do I need? What kind of pump should I use? Well, the, uh, one of the first questions you wanna look at is how much money do you wanna spend? Because there are, there are Cadillacs. These are very convenient to use because you, you don't have to worry about plugging or unplugging. These are more inexpensive. If you want something simple, 
where you just uh, flip a switch. When you're done watering, you flip the switch off. These work just fine. Um, if you want something that's on all the time, where you're not messing with an electrical outlet by flipping the switch, these pressurize the water all the time. You walk up to your faucet, open it, boom, you've got instant pressurized rainwater. We basically have over here what I call on-demand pumps, these three right here. When you hook these three pumps up to a rainwater tank, it pressurizes the water in a piping system to a faucet or an irrigation system, and it's always pressurized. It has sensors and built in so that when the pressure drops in that system, the pump knows to kick on automatically. These three pumps right here are more what you call transfer pumps. There, when you plug the pump in, it pressurizes the water, shoots it through a pipe, wherever you want to use it. You, what these pumps you cannot do is let them run all the time. For instance, if you're using a, a hose end sprayer and you were watering with water coming from one of these pumps, you could not let go of that hose end sprayer, thus stopping the water going through the hose and letting the pump continue to run. The pump has to have water going through it. That's what maintains it from overheating. So back to the question, which pump do I use? If you want something simple, where you just uh, flip a switch, when you're done watering, you flip the switch off, these work just fine. Um, if you want something that's on all the time, where you're not messing with an electrical outlet by flipping the switch, these pressurize the water all the time. You walk up to your faucet, open it, boom, you've got instant pressurized rainwater. All right, we did have another question it, um, from Sandy. We were told that we need two spouts coming into our tank due to the size of the roof. Is this a problem? Okay, so um, most of these bigger tanks have a 16 inch lid on the top. It has a five inch center lid. So you unscrew that center lid and throw it away. And that gives you one five inch opening to put one downspout into. Then what we do is we'll drill a second hole in that lid somewhere a five inch, uh, four or five inch round hole that you can put your second downspout into. So no, that's no problem to do that. All right, any other comments? All right, Rick, I think we're ready to get started with your presentation then. Okay, and before I get started here, I wanna follow up on a question that was early in the presentation about the demand side of your system. Um, and that's something that you have to evaluate with what you want to use this rainwater for. I remember years ago, I had a customer that bought a 65 gallon tank from me and they wanted to use it just for their indoor house plants. And I said, well, that'd be perfect because those plants aren't gonna use a lot of water and the rainwater like we talked before isn't gonna have the salts and calcium that groundwater does. And when you, you all know when you're watering potted plants that salt and calcium builds up in that pot and it, um, it hurts the health of the plant. The only way to get rid of that is you need to flush those pots every so often and you can do that in your sink or outside with a hose. Just really heavily water the pot and that flushes out the salts and calciums that have built up over time by using tap water. But when you're using rainwater you don't have that to begin with. So yes rainwater is much more uh, friendly on uh, landscaping and on plants. So um, let's, I want to talk a little bit about our 30-year um, average of rainfall. So I, you can see here on your screen the Sierra Vista and the Tucson. I, I do a lot of work up in Tucson too. I have a lot of customers I've worked with. But as you can see in the Sierra Vista area here, we have a 14.22 inches. That's the 30-year average. And as you can see, it shows it rains every month. Well, we all know that doesn't happen because this is an average. So like in January, it says 0.98 inches. Well, one year it might not rain at all in January or might not rain for two or three years in January. And then one year we'll get three inches of rain in January. So that's how they figure the average. So uh, I kind of have to snicker sometimes at these um, tables that people try to create um, that say, well, I'm gonna get this much rain every month so I need a tank this big because then it'll, I know what my water usage is. I know what my intake is. You don't know what your intake is because you're dealing with mother nature. So it's when we get it, we get it. When we don't, we don't. It's just, that's about as best as we can do. But uh, one of my philosophies I've kind of uh, 
settled on is we just, the more capacity you have available, the longer that water will last until you run out of it. Um, when I first started this, I had a 3,000 gallon tank I would use on my 1,500 square foot vegetable garden I had here at the house. Um, that water would last for about a month and a half once I started using that through my drip system. And when I ran out, I just had to wait for the rains to come. Um, a little side note, one number of years ago, two Junes in a row, the first week in June, very unusual. I got a one inch rain event. The first week of June, I was out of water by that time. That one inch of rain filled up my system enough to get me to when the monsoon started. So I was able to continue using rainwater. You, you just don't, never know when it's gonna rain, but the larger your tank, the longer that water's gonna last till you run out of it. Okay, so next slide. So I've only got about 10 slides here. I'm just gonna touch on a couple things and show you some um, actual practical uses where, um, and reasons why I picked these slides. So if you have scuppers coming out of your house, this is what typically a gutter company will do with your scupper. They'll put a box over it of different shapes. They run that down into a gutter. Now here at this person's house, uh, he didn't want to tank out the back of his patio, which I wouldn't either. Um, so what we did is we ran the gutter around the corner and put the 500 gallon tank in the corner where you don't even see it. And typically that's what I, I recommend for people. You, most people don't want to put a tank right by their front door, for instance. So the sides of the houses are typically the best places where the tank's out of sight, out of the way. You've got, there's usually space over there um, to put something if you can just get the gutter or the downspout uh, into the tank. Uh, next slide. Uh, here's a, the, actually this is the same house. Um, I'm just showing more of those boxed up scuppers, but I also want to point out linking two tanks together. Sometimes uh, people, now in this instance, it's not the case. They had plenty of room for a bigger tank, but he just wanted to put two smaller tanks that didn't stick out so far from his wall, from the house, um, and just link them together. And I like linking tanks from bottom to bottom. So as, you, as one tank is filling, both tanks fill simultaneously. And the other advantage is when you're draining a tank, you're really draining both tanks at the same time because water level always, water always seeks its own level. So as the first tank is draining, the second one will follow suit. Uh, next slide. Another example of a smaller link system. These are two 200 gallon tanks linked together within an inch and a half pipe um, or two inch pipe is what we typically use to link tanks together. So water can very quickly go from the tank that's being filled while it's raining into the companion tank, we call it. Okay, next slide. Now here's a, a, a wet delivery system that you can see. So on the left picture, up high, I'll see if my cursor works here. Um, that's where the gutter is, is right there at the top. So when this fills, the water goes down this pipe, goes over here. He wanted to put a flush out system here. So if ever he wanted to clean this piping out, he has a screwed on cap right here. That was a female adapter with a, a four inch plug screwed in. He could unscrew that plug and flush all the water out of these pipes. The other time you might want to flush the water out of your pipes is if it gets really cold in the winter and we've got a really good cold spell coming, he can drain these pipes so that he doesn't have to worry about them freezing and cracking. Uh, it would take a long, period of very cold time to freeze a four inch column of water. What typically will happen with these tanks is the little ball valve that's over here. If you know anything about ball valves, when they're closed and they can, there's just a little bit of water in that ball, that, that little bit of water can freeze pretty quickly and it has a lot of strength in it and power. And it, the only place it has to go when it expands is out the side of the ball valve. So you'll notice when your ball valve gets a little crack along the side, well, that's because it froze over the winter and um, it now has developed a crack. 99% of the time, the only time the water leaks out of that crack is when you're moving the handle of the ball valve from closed to open or open to closed. When the ball valve is all the way closed or all the way open, that crack is typically isolated from the water in the tank. So it's, most people just live with it but if you want to, you can replace those ball valves. They're $10, $15 a piece at Ace, you can get them. 
Um, and anyway, that's a 660 gallon tank, as you can see there. And uh, here's the view from the other direction coming off the gutter. But you'll notice the difference in the height between the bottom of that gutter and the top of this tank. So the, um, like I said earlier, one to two feet is generally, you want at least that amount. Um, if you have a big roof, uh, like many thousands of feet, you want that to be even taller to, to allow water pressure to back up in that pipe and push the water through quickly. If you don't have enough distance, what's gonna happen is this water will back up during a rain event, it'll back up this pipe and it'll make it up to the gutter and the water has nowhere to go but out the top of this pipe or out the top of the gutter. It'll back up the water into the gutter. So, uh, next, next slide. All right, this is a system over in Bisbee and uh, there were some pictures of it on um, Marianne's presentation but he wanted to harvest off his entire roof, but he didn't want to have tanks around his entire building. So he did a, it's a fairly elaborate wet delivery system. This is one side of the roof where he's got a downspout here and pipe going down. And the difference in height between the top of the tank here and the bottom of his gutter is probably four or five feet. So when this tank is full with water, when this, when this pipe right here fills with water, it's gonna flow through this pipe and dump into the tank. When the rain stops, this pipe right here is always gonna have water in it to the same height as this pipe right here. So this pipe, will, when it's not raining, will have water in it up to about this height. And then this will all be, uh, we would call head pressure. As the water builds up, it creates more head pressure, pushes that water out quicker. These are two 2,600 gallon tanks linked together. And then there's a, a pump inside this tank that then runs water to all of his uh, drip irrigation system. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's even a pressure tank. In Mary Ann's picture, it showed up, but it doesn't show in this picture. There's a blue um, pressure tank over here that stores pressure. So when the drip irrigation timer opens up, that pressure in that pressure tank pushes water to the irrigation system. Once the water level pressure gets down to a set level, typically around 25 or 30 PSI, the pump kicks on and then supplies pressure while the irrigation system is running. Um, all right, next picture. Another wet delivery system. This is over in Tucson. Here's the, he had a metal downspout here. We just ran it into this pipe that's about 10 feet above the ground and it just comes into this tank that's about four and a half, five feet tall. And the way these systems work is you're using a good size pipe, either three inch or four inch. Four inch will carry a lot more volume of water than three inch will. So if you have a bigger roof, you can get by with a less, less height difference between here and here by using four inch pipe. If you have a lot of height, you can get by with three inch pipe would work just fine. The next slide. Um, Oh, I think this might be my last slide. So I want to talk, um, before I talk about this, I want to talk a little about first flush systems. Um, I, I have become a person that does not believe in them too much. The only time I would use, consider using a first flush system is if you were going to use it for your drinking water for your house, then I would consider using something like that. But um, the only thing that's going to be on your roof is dust and bird poop. And the bird poop is a source of nitrogen for your plants. It's not gonna hurt anything. The dust will eventually settle out in the bottom of the tank. And that's not a bad thing to have mud in the bottom of the tank. I had a customer years ago over in Bisbee that wanted a bigger first flush system. So we put in a 200 gallon tank. And once that 200 gallon tank filled with water, the water would back up to her gutter and then allow the water from the gutter to go into her 2,500 gallon tank. And the first big rain that they had, she called me and said that, you know, after that 200 gallon tank filled up, the water going into the big tank was still dirty. And I got thinking about that, you know, you got to have a big enough um, to, to, um, storage container to hold the water from your entire roof. And if you can just imagine the water near the downspout, the roof, the roof that's near the downspout is going to get nice and clean, but the roof that's far away from your downspout probably will never make it into the first flush because it has too far to go. It has too much roof to go down, too much gutter to go into. So that 
dirty water is going to go into your tank anyway. Um, these first flushes where they people use some four-inch pipe, maybe three or four pipe, either four-inch pipe, that's maybe three gallons of water. You, you know, that might cover the first 10 or 20 square feet of roof that might be cleaned before the rest of the roof, which you never got a chance to get in the first flush, is going, going to go into your tank anyway. So it, it just adds uh, expense to a system that I don't feel is warranted. And then typically that first flush water is not handled properly. In other words, it's not utilized in, an, in a positive manner, such as draining to a tree or something. It's, they just let it drain on the ground and it's wasted water. So with the little the amount of rainfall we get in Arizona in a year, I, I'm just not a proponent of wasting any of my rainwater. So I just let the dust settle in the bottom of the tank. I let the bird poop fertilize my plants and I don't do first flushes. This system I wanna point out is kind of an interesting system I did over in Tucson. These are two Polymart tanks in the back. They're 500 gallons. We had to go with those because they're only four feet wide. And as you can see the pathway here, they didn't have a lot of room. So we had to put, so that's a thousand gallons right there. That is linked underground into this 870 70 gallon tank, which is an Enduroplast tank. And a few years ago, I, discussed, I was doing some experimenting and some thinking about ideas. This has a half horsepower sump pump in the bottom of this 870 gallon tank. And the pipe comes up through the top of this tank, comes out, comes over, it goes down and goes through their irrigation system. This is a uh, electronic timer made by Intramatic, which is the same kind of timer you use to power your lights on your living room at night when they turn them on, on and off automatically. The difference with this timer is it's rated for a half horsepower motor. It's also rated for 15 amps. So this, this pump is a half horsepower motor, so it's fine. And that pump is probably about seven or eight amps. So this timer is able to work with that. <clears throat> so what we do is uh, we plug this cord into so, some electricity, which they hadn't done yet when I finished, when I took this picture is right after we installed it. And then we, they will set the timer to come on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 9 to 9.30. Um, so it'll send electricity to turn the pump on, which, which and those pumps are fairly inexpensive. Uh, a half horsepower, half horsepower sump pump, you're looking a little over a hundred bucks, $130, five for that pump. Um, and it produces 13 PSI of pressure. So when the timer sends electricity to the pump, it turns on, it runs for half an hour. When the timer shuts off electricity, the pump shuts off. Now there's one really important thing if you do something like this, you need to understand. Once you've charged this pipe here with water and it's going to your drip irrigation system, and that pump shuts off, you've created a siphoning effect already. So once the pump shuts off, this tank will continue to siphon water out of it until it is empty. So what you have to do, what I did is right inside this tank, I drilled an eighth inch hole in that PVC pipe higher than the high water level mark in the tank. So when this tank is plumb full with water, that hole is in air. It's not submerged below the water line. So when the pump cuts, cuts off, um, it sucks air back into the pipe and it breaks that siphon. And so your water just goes doo and stops. And the same thing with the pipe inside the tank, it goes doo and stops wherever the water level is inside the tank. Um, so when the pump is on, yeah, you're peeing water, a little tiny stream of water is, is peeing back into the tank and it kind of helps res so you're not losing that water but having that hole there will break that siphon effect. Um, so anyway, that, and uh, another thing I might point out these tanks right here is the overflow. This little overflow device is called a Mozzie Stop. It's made by the same company called Rain Harvest that I use their overflows on. So this overflow, I drill a three inch hole on this tank. I have three options on where to install this. You have a, a flat spot here, here, and over on the backside. We pick the most um, advantageous place to put the overflow. I drill the hole, and the it's a elbow that sticks inside the tank pointing up. So most tanks, when they reach to the bottom of an overflow, they start to overflow. 
with this design, the water has to go three inches higher to get to the top of that elbow before it overflows. So you gain three inches of capacity in the top of the tank just with the use of that overflow system. In fact, there's another video that it's, Enduroplast a couple of years ago uh, came out and filmed me for a couple of days. So all those videos you saw that was done by Enduroplast, they were the ones that um, filmed it and then edited it and put it together. And I have an, another video of, on their website of how to install this overflow system. The, the overflow comes with a screen but that inserts, but if you don't keep an eye on that screen, it can clog up over time. If scum forms on the surface of your water, if any little particle gets through that primary 16 inch basket strainer under the lid, that little three inch screen is gonna clog up pretty quickly. And when it does, the only place the water can go is out the top of the tank when, when the tank is trying to get rid of the water that's in it because it's all full. So I don't like using that little screen, screen insert. I like using this thing called a mozzie stop, which is a little trap door that sits at a 45 degree angle and there's a hinge right at the top. So when the water pushes against it, it opens up, lets the water fall out of the mozzie stop. And then when the rain stops overflowing the tank, because the rain stops, gravity just closes that door and doesn't let mosquitoes, especially mosquitoes get into that tank to breathe. So it's just another neat little feature that um, I've been using for a number of years on my tanks. I think it just makes it a better rainwater harvesting tank, more, more uh, mosquito proof. All right. Oh, oh, there is a. Oh, there are two more pictures. Go back one. Um, Hold on. Give me just a second. Yeah, that that. Uh, it doesn't like me once I, I go. That was my last picture. There are two more. There we go. Okay, so this this is a picture of a sump pump. Oh, this isn't my house. Um, this is a picture of a one horsepower sump pump in a two hundred gallon tank, and I have three smaller tanks around my shop building that are plumbed into this two hundred gallon tank. I have two. 50 gallon tanks that come in right here and I have a 100 gallon tank that comes in over here through these piping. So when it's raining, I've got two downspouts coming into the top of this tank and I've got three pipes coming into the bottom of the tank from roof areas that were on the other side of this building. When the water starts entering this tank, this little blue float will rise up and there's a switch in that float that turns this pump on pumps it out through this inch and a half pipe into a 3,000 gallon tank, which is now my, my 12,000 gallon tank at a rate of, um, of three, I think it rated at three to 4,000 gallons per hour. So if I had on my 2,500 square foot shop roof, if my memory serves me correctly, if I had a rain event that was three inches and it rained uh, for 60 minutes at exactly the same amount, which will never happen. But if it rained for 60 minutes at the same rate, and at the end of that hour, I had got three inches of rain, this tank would never have overflowed. This pump would have kept up with that amount of water. What typically will happen is we'll get a, we'll get a 10 inch rain event, that, but we'll get it for 15 minutes. So if it rained for an hour, we would have gotten 10 inches. But instead of raining for an hour, it only rained for 15 minutes. So we got two and a half inches of rain in 15 minutes. Now in that case, this pump probably won't keep up with it. I'll probably lose some water out of the overflow of this tank, which is this pipe right here. But um, I will get a lot of it, if not, but the vast majority of the water will get moved into my big tank. This is used in the situation where you, your gutter is lower than the tank you wanna use. So the only way to make water go uphill is you gotta pump it. You gotta pump it up into a taller tank. That's why this system is, I'm using the system at my house. Okay, next slide. Here's a, now here's an example of that kind of system I just explained. There's a sump pump inside this tank. So we got all the water from this side of the house. Um, I mean, we could have probably run a gutter possibly across the back of his house and in the tank but, uh, or a downspout, but you would have seen it through the window. So it just would have been a little unsightly. So we have um, this downspout running this 200 gallon tank with a pump in it that then pumps the water underground through this inch and a half pipe up and in the top of this tank. And then on the back of this house, there's a lot of roof area. There's just a downspout of what we call a dry delivery system into the top of this 2,800 gallon tank. And um, so 
I think that's the last slide, Nicole. Yes, it is. Okay. So I, I had one question come up from earlier from one of your videos. It was asking about the pumps that they want to know what the name of the pump was that kept pressure all of the time and maybe particularly name brands, et cetera. Okay. If you remember the, that table, the pump on the far left that was really tall and black, that's a Grunfuss SBA 45A. And that's the pump I use in all my um, commercial or larger rainwater harvesting systems. That pump produces 60 to 70 PSI. It has a float switch on it so that when, if the water gets really low in the tank and you're almost out of water, that float switch will turn off the pump so it allows you not to burn the pump up by running it dry. Um, that's about a $750 pump retail, uh, and it um, has a two-year warranty. Uh, it's a really high-quality pump. Well, I just finished installing, any of you are familiar with um, uh, Mary Jo's Birdhouse Mary, uh, off Turkey Track, south of town. We just installed two 2,800-gallon tanks in the back of the house, and then I put a 100-gallon tank in the front of the house, with a little um, uh, Harbor Freight um, uh, sump pump in it that pumps the water around to those big two, two big tanks in the back of the house. And then there's that Grunfuss pump inside that 2,800 gallon tank. And the reason I chose that pump, especially is for fire, that pump puts out so much pressure, I would feel, feel very comfortable myself um, using that pump to ward off a brush fire around my house. And I have the same pump in my 12,000 gallon tank. So going on, the next pump you saw with that blue tank, that was a, called a shallow well pump. Uh, I buy those at Harbor Freight. You, they're around $120, $150. I would recommend getting the two year warranty, which is gonna cost you about another 30 bucks. And if there's anything goes wrong with that pump in two years, no questions asked, they'll give you a new one. Um, and that pump produces about 50 PSI. It has that little a three gallon pressure tank, so which which helps with um, when it pump first starts off. It's a, it's advantageous to have a pressure tank with that pump. So that's an all all contained unit. I installed lots of those for homeowners to run uh, drip systems and stuff. The other three pumps um, you saw on that table, two of them were shallow well. Were I'm sorry, um, trans were um, sump pumps. In other words, they have a float switch on them. So when, um, and people use those in their basements when they have flooding issues, like back in the Midwest and stuff, you put it in, in a lowest spot of your basement and the water ever gets in your basement, that float switch goes, floats up, turns the pump up on, pumps the water out of your basement. So in our situation, the float switch goes up, pumps the water out of your smaller tank into your bigger tank, and they, they move a lot of water uh, uh, a lot of volume, but they do that by using a larger pipe. You don't use like a hose or three quarter inch pipe. I, if you may, may have remembered on my um, video, I was that slide I was talking about that pump only produces about 13 PSI. It's not a lot of pressure, but actually I find that I have that one of those pumps in my uh, system at my house where I have a 2000 gallons of storage and the pressure it produces I find very adequate for watering around the garden. It's not like a fire hose, but it's not a drip either. It's a nice flow of water. Um, those old shallow well pumps, if you want to move a lot of water volume wise, you hook them up to an inch and a half or a two inch pipe, and they'll do three to 4,000 gallons an hour because of the larger pipe. You can do that. Now, if you, want, if you want a pump that just produces a lot of pressure, then that first pump I talked about, it, it does that. Then what was the last? Then the last pump on the table is called a transfer pump, and uh, once again at Harbor Freight, they're about a hundred, hundred twenty dollars. That pump will produce about fifty psi. It's almost too much pressure to water your garden with. I mean, if I was going to fight a fire, I, uh, that's the pump I'd want to have. In fact, when we had the fires here seven years ago, I was using that pump, that same pump, to run three Rainbird sprinklers around my house before the fire got close to my house, but we, we escaped the fire by a few hundred yards, but I, I was ready. Um, but that, that pump, if you wanna move water quickly from one tank to another tank, or you wanna water your wells around your trees quickly, 
if you have some depressions you dug around your wells of your trees and you want to water those quickly, that's a good pump. Uh, what you do is you have to make yourself a short two foot hose using a really heavy uh, vinyl tubing material like the, the vinyl tubing you see with the fiberglass strands running through it and make sure it's really stout because on the suction end of a pump, if you use too thin of a hose, it'll actually collapse that hose and make it flat and stop the water flow because of the suction side. So you want a, a hose that will keep its round shape. You put on two female hose um, brass hose adapters on that two foot hose and then you screw one end onto your ball valve on the bottom of your rainwater tank, screw the other end into the inlet side of the pump, and then screw your 100 foot garden hose on the outlet side of the pump. Once you plug that in, um, boom, you got pressure. And then, that, but that's the kind of pump, like the transfer pumps, you can't stop the pressure while the pump is running. If you stop, I mean, you can't stop the water flow while the pump is running because the pump needs that water flow to cool itself. If you stop that water, the pump inside the pump head will eventually turn to steam and it'll melt O-rings and gaskets. And you, in essence, you've burned up the pump. That's what we call burning up the pump. Um, so there's, anyway, different kinds of pumps. I, I, I'm a strong believer in if the pump, water is convenient to use, people will use it. A lot of people would just use gravity pressure from the water coming out of the tank, but you're going to get a pretty slow flow. Um, if you've got time on your side and you don't mind that, then you're not using any electricity. And like I said earlier in one of my videos, then that conserves our electricity um, that we use. But if you want to use it more conveniently, um, a small pump can, can make the water more convenient to use. Any other questions? I, if you still have questions, I'd love them if you would put them into the chat box for me. Before we, we did have a, I'm sorry, Nicole, we did have a question um, about solar pumps that can oh, yes. deliver a good amount of pressure. You know, I don't know, I don't know a lot about solar pumps. We did have a tour a few years ago of a gentleman over at Bisbee that I, I thought was pretty um, cool what he was doing. He had a his big tank, he had like a 2,600 gallon tank on one part of his property, but it was only collecting water off a small part of his roof. Um, and the bigger part of his roof was on the other side. And he had a, about a 1,500 gallon tank over by the garden where the bigger roof was. And when he used up all the water out of the 1,500 gallon tank, he, would, he got a little pump off of Amazon, that will fit in the palm of your hand. And it was a solar pump, it was very small plastic, and it, what, he worked it off of a small solar panel um, and he would transfer the water from the 2600 gallon tank to the garden hose over into his 1500 gallon tank on the other side of the house. And he said it would take a number of hours to do it, but he, he was just using this small solar panel. Um, I don't know a lot about, and I, I kind of stayed away from that, uh, the solar end of things. So you'd have to find somebody that knows more about solar pumps than me. That is a good topic to be researched, and I will do so and see if I can find some people who have been using those solar pumps. I know there's more interest in them than ever. Um, so contact me and I will send you whatever I find out. We had another question come in. Um, are the basic principles um, to use building, what are some of the basic principles in using dry stream beds and building those? Using a, a dry what dry stream, stream bed. bed? So the the pass of uh, water harvesting the dry stream beds. Um, Marianne, you might want to answer that. I, I uh, you're just basically going to dig a ditch um, and then line it with some gravel for aesthetics and also for flowing flowing down the water. Um, if the water has to go around a lot of gravel and rocks in the stream bed, it'll slow down its course give me the chance to soak in more. The whole idea with passive water star harvesting is to slow down the water or and stop it on your property so it has a chance to um, soak in. If you get a, uh, you know, a big rain event on your property and it lasts for 10 minutes, 
that water is boom, it's gone. It really didn't have any chance to soak into the ground. It's going to run downhill and it's off your property. By creating yeah, I would, I would agree that they're, they're great. They're, they're somewhat cosmetic um, just because they don't have the depth. But anytime you're doing passive rain harvesting, you want to consider the slope of the land where the water is running anyway and try to guide it appropriately by making um, love, changing the level of the property enough to get the water to where you want it to go. But yes, as Rick said, those aren't too hefty because they tend not to be very deep. And, they, and so they're pretty, um, but they won't do that much in terms of harvesting rain passively. 